Last week, when we abstracted from summing together a list of numbers and multiplying together a list of numbers, we actually came up with an abstraction that is very useful and very general called fold R. Fold R is not listed in figure 95 of the textbook. It's listed in figure 96. Fold R is at the top. You can see its signature, purpose, and header, as well as an example of how it computes. Let's look at the signature of fold R more closely to see how it applies to summing together a list of numbers and multiplying together a list of numbers. Here's the signature of fold R. Suppose that we want to sum together a list of numbers. Well, that means we have a list of numbers to start with. Fold R takes as input a list of x's, so x must be number. Let's write that down. When we sum together a list of numbers, we end up with a number. Fold R gives us a y as output. We want a number, fold R gives us a y, so y is probably a number. Let's write that down. So what we've discovered is that fold R has a more specific signature. If we change every x to number, and we also change every y to number, we end up with a signature that fold R has. We have a list of numbers, let's say this list of numbers. And now we just need the two other inputs to fold R. The second input is the number to produce for the empty list. In other words, what does it mean to sum up an empty list of numbers? That's zero. The first input to fold R is how to combine two numbers into a result number. And because we want to sum together a list of numbers, that's plus. So now we're ready to run fold R and we're gonna get the sum of this list of numbers that's here. If we want to multiply together a list of numbers, we can use the same signature of fold R where X is still number and Y is still number. And what we need to do differently is to pass these two inputs differently. Instead of adding, we're going to multiply. That's another function with the same signature. And instead of starting with zero, which is going to give us zero all the way if we keep multiplying by zero, we're going to start with one. And now we have not just the sum of that list, but also the product of this list. So that's summing and multiplying together a list of numbers. But fold R is actually a lot more useful depending on what X and Y are. Again, as with any other abstraction, when you start to use this abstraction, you have to ask yourself, what is X and what is Y? One way to see how fold R is so useful in general is to look at how Fold R is kind of like saying how you would like to fill in the list processing template. And the list processing template is a very general and useful thing. So to remind ourselves, let's take a look at how we wrote the number summing function before. Here's a template for summing together a list of numbers. When we Fill in the template, we have two places to fill in. We have to say what to do for the empty list, and if the list is not empty, how to combine the first number in the list and the sum of the rest of the list into the overall result. So we have to fill in these two places. We fill it in with zero and plus. And those are the two inputs to fold R. So the two inputs to fold R other than the list are just how to fill in the list processing template. And if we want to fill it in with not plus and zero, but times and one, then we end up with multiplying together a list of numbers. 
So that's how summing together or multiplying together a list of numbers, or more generally, anything that we can do by filling in the list processing template can be expressed using FoldR. Let's look at another example of using FoldR where x is not number and y is not number. Suppose that we have a list of strings and we want to draw it as a whole image. And we're going to draw each string as an image that's just a piece of text. And then we're going to put each of these images on top of each other. Let's design a function. Let's call it text. It's going to take a list of strings and return an image. Again, we're just going to put each string into a piece of text that's an image and then stack those images on top of each other. Okay, stack text for the given strings on top of each other. Okay. Let's write some examples. And that's going to be important for us to even figure out or explain to ourselves what the function is supposed to do. If the input is empty, well, we have to return an image nevertheless. We're always supposed to return an image. So let's just pick some kind of simple, empty-ish image. Let's, let's use, I don't know, a small circle. How about this small gray circle uh, as the image to return, like a little dot when there's actually no string? To turn into stack text. It's more interesting, of course, when there are strings like hello and goodbye in the list. Well, then we need a stack of images. So let's use this function called above from the 2HDP image library that uh, will take a bunch of images and stack them one on top of the other. Um, so let's turn hello into a piece of text. Um, let's make it uh, size 40 and red. Let's take goodbye and turn it into a piece of text. And finally, we still have this solid dot at the bottom. Let's start to design the function. Let's say we have a list of strings. Now we could just use the list processing template, but let's try to use FoldR to see how it works. What we have is a list of strings and FoldR takes a list of numbers. Ah, not just a list of numbers. FoldR has this more general signature. FoldR takes a list of X's. So if we have a list of strings, and we want to give it to FoldR, then it looks like X should be straight. And at the end, we want to get an image out, but FoldR gives us Y out, so it looks like Y better be image. Now, what we discovered is that FoldR has a more specific signature than this. If we go through this signature, and every time x appears, we change it to string, like this. And every time y appears, we change it to image. Then we have a specific signature for fold r. And we already have the list of strings to pass as the third input to fold r. Let's write that down. We're going to have two inputs. And then the third input is just going to be this list of string. And the result is going to be the image we want. And all we have left to do is to figure out what are these two inputs. What are these two inputs? Well, the image is not that hard to come up with. The image, that's the second input to FoldR, is what to do when the list is empty. And we have an example for this. So instead of copying this expected output from the example into the list processing template, I'm going to copy it into a call to FoldR. And now we need the first input. That's going to be a function that takes a string and an image and returns an image. The image here is going to be what has already been drawn for the rest of this list of strings. So we're going to take this string, turn it into a piece of text that's an image, and put 
that image on top of this image, put that image for the string above this image. We could design a helper function for that. We could also, because this function is relatively short, use lambda to express this helper function. So I'm going to write lapparent lambda. And remember, I'm going to have a function with this signature. Actually, it's kind of useful to remind ourselves that we have this signature. So I'm going to put this signature here as a comment, just to remind myself. Now remember, lambda takes two inputs. The first input is just what inputs our functions should take. So we're going to have a string and an image. I'm going to call it s and img, being inside parentheses. That's the first thing we give to lambda. And the second thing to give to lambda is what to return. So um, it should be above with two images. The first image is when we turn the string into a red piece of text. And the second image is just the IMG that we got. That's for the rest of the list. OK, so this is how we combine a string and an image into an image. And we were able to write this function because we know its signature. And we got the signature by asking at the beginning of our process of using Fodar, what is x and what is y? So again, when you use an abstraction, begin by asking, what is x and what is y? OK, let's test this piece of code. And our test pass. And now we're able to draw pictures like this, where piece of text are stacked on top of each other. And we can do that for any number of strings.